Well, thank you. Bo, are you here somewhere? I have something to say to you. <laughs> there he is. Uh, my grandson came up to me, he was in the choir last night, and said, now they're telling old man jokes about you. So I, I feel like I've entered across the Rubicon there. Bo, I want you to know I'm going to parrot uh, Ronald Reagan. Uh, I know that uh, I'm not going to make age an issue at this council meeting, uh, and I'm not going to exploit for political purposes your youth and uh, inexperience. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your kindness to us through the years. As we look back, we see a great cause for rejoicing. We see your faithfulness that's new each morning. And for that reason, we turn and can look ahead and have great hope. We have your promise, and your promise is sure. Bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. After 25 years, it is good to see this great assembly. Uh, it's come a long way since a little over 26 years. I sat in a room in Moscow with a handful of people discussing the idea of the CREC. And to look here and to see this, it is just amazing. And to know that you are engaged in the most important work on earth. I trust that you've come here to join with your fellow soldiers of Jesus Christ to be encouraged, strengthened, and blessed. To that end, it is good for us to reflect. It is good for us also then to project, to gain some perspective, and to prepare for whatever comes next. Perseverance is my topic, or steadfastness, requires continued effort or to, to, in order to do and achieve something despite the difficulties, the failures, or the opposition. On the one hand, we start with the Proverbs admonition to not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And this is followed by Paul's instruction to Pastor Timothy to guard what was committed to your trust and then to commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach, also, to teach others also. We are in a long race to accomplish this mission. And correct perspective is critical to any mission. It might be tempting for us to get caught up in our daily work and to think that what we are doing in the moment is all important or worse, that we are all important or even worse, that we're not important at all. Proper perspective is very difficult to maintain. I know that many of you labor long and hard in the trenches of ministry day in and day out. Our ministerial trials and burdens often capture all of our attention and all of our energy. The CREC is a collection of churches, ministers, and elders who have gathered together to give counsel, comfort, and encouragement and to share one another's burdens to rejoice and weep together. Yet sometimes the tempest in our own teapots can seem overwhelming, and again, we find it very easy to lose proper perspective. Our circle can seem like the only circle or a vicious circle. Scriptures teach us that God humbles the proud and exalts the humble. I have told many a struggling pastor, and while I tell them, I remind themselves that if you never preach again, the kingdom of God will be just fine. Brothers, God does not need us, but he does, he does allow us the privilege of participating in what he's doing. Most of the hundred billion people who have lived on the earth have been forgotten, and so too will be forgotten within a hundred years, years of our death, and that is humbling news Moreover, the CREC is tiny. So how are we going to change the world if all we are is a drop in the ocean? Here, uh, here's, where we, here's where the other part of perspective comes in. 2 Corinthians 4.18, we do not look at the things which are seen, but the, at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We are little, but we serve a big God. He has the long view, and so must we. And we might soon be forgotten on the earth, but we will never be forgotten by God. Every little thing has a part in his big plan and is essential to that big plan. 
Of course, before we can know where we're going, we first must know where we came from. In ourselves, we have no possibility of gaining accurate perspective. Everything is subjective to us. We know almost nothing about the past, the present, and the future, and we certainly don't know how all of those things relate to each other, which leaves us in that place of total uncertainty if we stop there. But thankfully, we don't stop there. In other words, Men in themselves know almost nothing about everything and grope in darkness. But God, who knows everything about the past, the present, and the future, and how all of those things relate to one another, knows everything for certain, and he is our only hope of knowing anything for certain, that is, if he is willing to reveal some of what he knows. And that is the good news. He has done so. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our sons forever, that we may do all the words of his law. There are many things by his grace that we know for certain. When situations arise, most often there's a lot more that I don't know than I do know. But I need to be reminded of what I do know and what God has revealed about himself and about me and about the world. God has revealed that we are part of something bigger and longer. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, and if we endure, we shall reign with him from the creation and the past, uh, from before creation and past the consummation. Each of us are part of his unfolding plan. History is a perpetual parade of God's people. We are all historically connected, and we are all eschatologically connected, past and future. He has called, he has sent, he has equipped, he has gifted his people, and therefore there are no unnecessary people. There are no unnecessary outposts in the kingdom of God. John Calvin offered these encouraging words, let us not cease to do the utmost that we may incessantly go forward in the way of the Lord, and let us not despair of the smallness of our accomplishments Though we fall short, our labor is not lost if this day surpasses the preceding one. Moreover, importance has little to do with longevity. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Think of the wide variety of longevity we see in the Bible between Noah and Joseph and Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Simeon and Paul. We stand on promises that are certain. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus said, and he saw it and was glad. A lot of things happen between Genesis 12 and the resurrection of Christ, and not a few difficult things, not a few discouraging things. A man could grow weary. One old man and one old woman and one son believing God blessed the whole world. It's impossible for us, but it is easy for God to feed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. And it's no problem for God to take a handful of men and turn the world upside down. Pastor Paul Carter wrote, Our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God who sent Moses into the desert for 40 years. He is the God who sent David into the caves for 13 years. He is the God who sent Saul into Tarsus for 10 years. He is far more crockpot than microwave. He sees the whole board and he plays a long game. Working for a God like that requires patience and perseverance. Don't be in a hurry and don't feel rushed. Just because you hear the clock ticking does not mean you are running out of time. You are a citizen of the eternal kingdom. You are not, you are not cannot, and will not ever run out of time. Don't make any short-term plans. Do what is right, believe what is true, and trust in what is sure. Don't be afraid to begin things that others will have to complete after you're gone. 
Hebrews 11 catalogs the countless acts of faith that God rewarded in time and is still rewarding. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. So maturity demands that we remember where we came from while pressing forward to meet the challenges of the future with wisdom and grace. God has placed us, his bondservants, in the 21st century to prepare and equip his people to weather whatever storms are coming our way, and they are coming. We cannot know where and how God might use this particular body of men and churches, but we do know that he uses and blesses faithful men and faithful churches. That's what we know. As many around us are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and taken captive by many novel notions, faithfulness to the authoritative word of God, defended and boldly declared, remains our central and great mission. The church is God's ark, the place of safety, preservation, and victory. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. The church is a lighthouse in the harbor. And like the sons of Issachar, we must understand our times and know what the church is to do, equipping the saints for service, that they might not be overcome by these changing seasons. Machen commented about the church in his day. The mass of the church here is still conservative, but conservative in an ignorant, non-polemic, sweetness and light kind of way, which is just meat for wolves. We are called to do something about that. Our generation is to be more than occupational troops. We should be that, holding the ground gained by those who have gone before us, but we should be much more because the war is not over and there are still beaches to be stormed. And I want to wrap up here with a longer quote from Machen. It was just so appropriate for this to hear uh, one who has been in the trenches and gone before us. He says, this is not the first time of discouragement in the history of the Christian church. Again and again, the gospel has seemed to be forever forgotten, yet always it has burst forth with new power and the world has been set aflame. So it may be in our day. God's spirit is all powerful and he can still bring men to the savior of their souls. Do you think this is a happy or blessed age? Oh no, my friends. Amid all the noise and shouting and power and machinery, there are hungry hearts. Hearts thirsting for living water, hearts hungry for the bread that is bread indeed, the hunger you alone can still. You, can do, you, you do so not by any riches of your own, but as humble ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. How wonderfully rich you are, my brethren, rich with riches greater by far than all the wealth and power of this world, rich with inexhaustible riches of God's word. Oh, may you use those riches. Remember this at least, the things in which the world is now interested are the things that are seen, but the things that are seen are temporary and the things that are not seen eternal. You, as ministers of Christ, are called to deal with the unseen things. You are the stewards of the mysteries of God. You alone can lead men and by, uh, by the proclamation of God's word, out of the crash and the jazz and the noise and the rattle and the smoke of this weary age into the green pastures and beside the still waters, you alone as ministers of, re of reconciliation can give what the world with all of its boasting and pride can never give, the infinite sweetness of the communion of the redeemed soul with the living God. Pastor Paul Carter again said, do your job, run your course, pass the baton, die and be forgotten. The race is rigged to rob all but one of fame and glory. So forget legacy, embrace obscurity, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and carry on. A right perspective is essential if we are to persevere. Adam saw Christ's day. I mean, Abraham saw Christ's day and rejoiced. And may we continue to see Christ's day. Jesus said the kingdoms of heaven 
The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures of meal until it was all leavened. Amen. Thank you.